A very good evening to one and all. Welcome to Shankar IAS Academy's daily newspaper analysis. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So without much delay, let us get into the news article discussion. Now look at this image from today's newspaper. This image shows elephants searching for food while crossing National Highway 17 near Guwahati. We know that keystone species like elephant is very important for UPSC exam. So let us revise certain facts about it in this news article discussion. Firstly, we shall see about the characteristics of elephants. See, elephants are the largest land animals. They are known for their impressive size and weight which can reach from 2700 kg to 6000 kg. Their distinctive trunk serves multiple purposes including breathing, smelling, touching, grasping and producing sounds. Elephants also have tusks which are long curved teeth made of ivory. Remember both male and female elephants can have tusks though they are larger than males. Then their large ears help them stay cool by flapping and radiating heat and their thick and sensitive skin requires mud baths to protect from sunburn and insect bites. See elephants are herbivores so they consume up to 150 kg of food per day including grass, leaves, fruits and bugs. They live in family group led by the oldest female known as the matriarch. While males typically live alone or in small bachelor groups once they reach maturity. In India, the Asian elephant is the predominant species. These elephants are smaller than their African counterparts and have smaller ears. They are primarily found in forested regions across states like Karnataka, Kerala, Assam, Tamil Nadu and Odisha. Remember, India has about 20,000 elephants and Karnataka has the highest elephant population in India. Also, India has undertaken various important projects to protect and conserve elephants. Let us see them one by one. Firstly, the national heritage animal status has been given to elephant in 2010 to ensure their protection. Secondly, the Mike program which was started in 2003, it monitors illegal elephant killing. Thirdly, the Elephant Task Force was created to address human-animal conflict and offer conservation solution. Then Project Rehab, it uses bee boxes to prevent elephants from entering human settlements. And the Hadi Mary Shadi campaign raises awareness about elephant conservation. Additionally, India has identified 88 elephant corridors to aid their movement between habitats. Know that the highest amount of elephant corridors is in West Bengal. So these are all very important facts that you have to remember about elephants. Three years back in prelims, we had uh, questions about elephant. So it is always important to revise about it. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this article from 19th July. This article talks about forest fire in Himachal Pradesh and what is the solution to the issue. So let us see them one by one in this news article discussion. See what happened was since April 15 there have been 1684 forest fire damaging 17,471 hectares of forest lands and causing harm to wildlife. From 2001 to 2023 Himachal Pradesh lost 957 hectares of trees from fires and 4.37 thousand hectares from other causes. So here comes the question what is the cause for this loss or what has caused this damage. See naturally fire happens during the pre-monsoon summer when there is less moisture due to less snow melting. The drier it is the worse the fires get. Human activities like leaving campfires unattended and throwing away cigarettes also start fires. Bad forest management and looking at forest only for their resources without involving local people also contribute to the problem. Talking about the impacts caused by these forest fires, see they release pollutants like black carbon which speeds up glacier melting in the Himalayas and affects the regional climate. Also, the history of forest use has made things worse. For example, in the 1850s, a lot of trees were cut down to build railways. Over time, valuable bunch oak trees, which help keep moisture and support local communities, were replaced with chirp pine trees. 
for timber and resin. Chir pine forests are very prone to fires. Today, 17.8 percentage of Himachal Pradesh land, which is about 37,033 square kilometers of forest area, is covered with chir pine trees. So you can use this as a case study in your GS answer. You can write it either in geography or in environment. Okay. Now, with this basic understanding, let us see what is the solution to this issue. See, firstly, local people should be involved in managing forest. Their traditional rights to use the forest for fuel, timber, and fodder should be restored. Secondly, mixed forest should be created. This should be created by replacing some chir pine tree with different kinds of trees to reduce fire risks. Thirdly, both scientific methods and traditional knowledge should be used for better forest management. Fourthly, water management techniques like building small dams and reviving water springs should be implemented. Then finally, support and funding from 16th Finance Commission are needed for disaster management and improving forest care. So these are all very relevant facts that you have to remember about Himachal Pradesh, forest fire, its causes and what are the possible solutions. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article. This article talks about G7 summit which was held in Italy's Apulia region from June 13 to 15. The leaders of the G7 nation like the US, Canada, Germany, France, Japan, UK, Italy along with the European Union participated to discuss a wide variety of issues. Though not a member, India has been invited to the outreach 11 times with our Prime Minister attending it for the fifth time. So this is the crux of the news article given here. So in this news article discussion, let us discuss the key objectives of the scheme one by one. See, firstly, bridging global differences in an earned manner. See, the summit aims to bridge the gap between Western countries and other parts of the world. This is crucial in light of increasing multipolarism in the world, which is often called the West and the Rest. Secondly, the summit aims to increase the support for Ukraine. It does this by finding new funding methods to support Ukraine with an agreement to allocate $50 billion from frozen Russian sovereign wealth funds. Thirdly, it talks about investing in Africa. The summit agrees for hosting a special energy for growth in Africa summit with a focus on promoting investment in clean energy across the continent. Moreover, it talks about tackling global challenges like migration, then climate change and the implication of artificial intelligence and etc. Fourthly, the summit cautions about the confronting trade practices of China and it calls for increasing engagement with the global south. See the G7 plans through its G7 outreach program called for the leaders from 10 countries and several international organizations to discuss the concerns of the global south. This is done primarily to shed its image as a western elite organization. So these are all the objectives of the summit. Now let us see about the role of India in the summit and its importance. See India which was represented by our Prime Minister Narendra Modi plays a significant role in the G7 outreach process. This is because India is key member of the global south. Due to its economic powers and cloud in the global south, India is a constant partner to the west for its outreach. India with the various positions like hosting the Voice of Global South Conference have also participated in the G20 Trika to further reinforce the matter of global south. Also remember, India as an influential participant used the forum to highlight its democratic achievements, spoke about the potential of technology and AI and stressed the need to address global inequalities and climate change. India used the forum to conduct various bilateral meetings with leaders from UK, France, Germany, Japan and Italy to deepen its cooperation. So with this basic understanding, let us see about the challenges of the G7. See, as I said earlier, G7 is affected by the perspective of elitism. It is seen as an exclusive group not representative of the world's top economies or broader global interest. Or to put it simply, G7 is not as influential as G20. So the increasing competition from the parallel organizations like BRICS is affecting its global clout. 
secondly effectiveness in global affairs see the g7 has struggled to influence significant global issues like russia's invasion of ukraine china's growing global influence and conflicts like israel gaza situation so to tackle these issues and to stay relevant the g7 should reinvent itself this can be done by adjusting its membership and strategies to better address the global challenges the upcoming summit in canada's alberta region in 2025 will be a crucial moment for g7's future direction and influence apart from this india's continued participation in the g7 outreach is crucial for the relevance of g7 but we need to wait and watch how it evolves to maintain its relevance in a rapidly changing global landscape so these are all very important facts that you have to remember about g7 summit we saw some of the objectives of the summit which includes bridging global differences in an earnest manner then to increase support to ukraine then to invest in africa especially in green energy and finally to confront trade practices of china and we saw about india's role in g7 india is an influential participant especially from the global south and then we saw some of the challenges faced by g7 so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion for today's mains answer writing discussion i have taken a previous year question let me read out the question for you what were the major technological changes introduced during the sultanate period how did those technological changes influence indian society see this question can be asked in gs paper 1 under art and science part and it is a straight forward question so you can write answer to this question in two parts first you have to write about major technological changes introduced during the sultanate period and in the second part you can talk about their impacts on indian society so this is how we are going to address this particular question moving on to the introduction part here you can write about sultanate period the sultanate period in india also known as the delhi sultanate was started in 2006 ad by qutubuddin aibak and lasted till 1526 ad the period saw several significant technological technological changes ranging from agriculture to architecture and urban planning which influenced indian society in various ways so with this basic introduction you can start writing the answer for the first part in the first part you have to write about the technological changes during the sultanate period see the first is architecture and construction the idea of islamic architectural styles and techniques revolutionized building practices in india the use of arches domes and minarets become prominent feature in structures such as minars in delhi constructed during this period this stands as a testament to the advancement in architectural engineering in addition for the plastering of buildings new materials like lime paste and gypsum were used according to historians like richard eaton islamic architecture not only introduced in new forms but also adopted local materials and tradition influencing a hybrid indo islamic style that persisted through subsequent centuries so this is the first major innovation secondly water management and irrigation see techniques like building step wells also called as biolis and reservoir that is tanks were introduced to ensure a sustainable water supply for irrigation and domestic use these innovation not only improved agricultural productivity but also supported development of urban centers for example the sultanate period in delhi constructed several biolis such as the agrasen ki bioli which served as vital water reservoir and social spaces reflecting the integration of technological and social needs thirdly agriculture see the introduction of the persian wheel revolutionized irrigation in india this allowed farmers to cultivate crops in areas that were previously arid a land measuring instrument known as gaze eye Sikandari was introduced during this period which improved the efficiency of tax collection fourthly talking about metrology and coinage the sultanate period witnessed advancement in metrological techniques particularly in the minting of coins copper silver and gold coins were standardized which facilitated trade and commerce across regions this standardization of coinage played a crucial role in economic transactions and state revenue according to numismatic studies coins from the sultanate period display intricate designs and inscriptions in arabic script indicating not only technological sophistication but also cultural integration fifthly industry 
So the textile industry flourished during this period. New techniques of dyeing were introduced. This resulted in production of high quality textiles. Pit loom was also introduced during this period, resulting in increased weaving efficiency. Then it was during this period the paper making industry flourished which later saw significant growth after the introduction of printing technology by the Portuguese. Then talking about the military, significant advancement were made which includes the use of firearms, cannon and watchlock muskets. This helped them to expand their territory. Then talking about the cultural advancement, this period witnessed the growth of Persian language and literature. Tabakat I Nasari written by Minhaj As Siraj is a significant example. Also during this period new musical instruments like sarangi and rabab were introduced. So you can write these points in the first part. Always remember give multi-dimensional points with supporting examples. This will give a diverse look to your answer. Moving on to the second part you have to write about the influence on Indian society by these technologies. See firstly the technology exchange during the Sultanate period facilitated cultural interactions between different communities. Islamic scholars and artisans brought new ideas and techniques leading to a synthesis of Indo-Islamic culture. This cultural fusion influenced art, literature, music and cuisine thereby creating a rich tapestry of cultural diversity. Secondly, technological advancement in agriculture, water management and coinage bolstered economic activities during the sultanate era improved irrigation techniques led to higher agricultural yield supporting a growing population and urban centers thirdly the construction of forts like the tuklagabad fort in delhi and golconda fort in deccan exemplify the strategic importance of technological advancement in military architecture so you can write all these points in the second half of your answer and move on to the conclusion part here you can write that the technological changes introduced during the Sultanate period had a profound and lasting impact on Indian society from architecture to agriculture, from commerce to culture. These advancements transformed every facet of life. The period witnessed a synthesis of indigenous and Islamic traditions fostering a dynamic cultural milieu. Moreover, technological innovation laid the foundation for economic prosperity and strategic dominance contributing to India's historical trajectory. So the Sultanate period stands as a testament to the transformative power of technological advancement in shaping societies and civilizations. So these are all some of the facts that you can from this discussion and also this is how you have to structure your main answer. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this article from editorial page from today's newspaper. According to the article, the Patna High Court has struck down the Bihar government's decision to increase reservation for various communities in job and education. The court said that total reservation cannot exceed 15%. It is a limit set by previous court rulings. The Bihar government had planned to raise reservation for backward classes from 12% to 18%, then for extremely backward classes from 18% to 25%, then for scheduled caste from 16% to 20%, and for the scheduled tribes from 1% to 2%. If you calculate, this change could make the total reservation to 65%. So the court ruled that the government's plan was unconstitutional because it aimed for proportionate equality based on caste population numbers. The court agreed with the petitioner that adequate representation does not mean proportional representation. This principle was established in the 1992 Indra Savani case. The court also rejected the state's argument that special circumstances justified exceeding the 50% limit. The court noted that there was no in-depth study before increasing the reservation. This judgment has raised questions about the thoroughness of the caste survey. This is what is given in the article. So in this news article discussion, let us understand about 1992 Indra Savani case briefly. See the 1992 Indra Savani case, also known as the Mandal Commission case, is a pivotal ruling by the Supreme Court regarding reservation for other backward classes. The case arose when the Indian government sought to implement quotas based on the Mandal Commission's recommendations. In this case, the Supreme Court's judgment set 
several significant precedents. It established a 50% ceiling on reservation to balance affirmative action with meritocracy, ensuring that half of the available seats or position remain open for general competition. The court also introduced the concept of the creamy layer within OPCs. This excludes economically advanced or socially influential individuals from reservation benefits. Additionally, the ruling emphasized that reservation should aim for adequate, not proportional. And the representation of backward class should be based on social and educational backwardness rather than just economic criteria. The judgment allowed for exception to the 50% limit in extraordinary circumstances but underscored the importance of periodic review and monitoring to prevent misuse of reservation benefits. But Tamil Nadu government has already breached the 50% ceiling in reservation at the time of this case. So the central government has passed 76th Amendment Act in 1994 to include the 69% reservation of Tamil Nadu in 9th schedule of constitution. So by this act, Tamil Nadu reservation was protected from judicial review. Overall, the Indra Sabani case has greatly shaped India's affirmative action policies while addressing the complex challenges of social justice and inclusion. So these are all very relevant facts that you have to remember from reservation policy in India. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this article about sickle cell anemia. This article says that Research are being undertaken to tackle sickle cell anemia with the help of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing technology. So in this backdrop, let us understand about sickle cell anemia from the prevalence perspective. See, sickle cell anemia is a genetic blood disorder characterized by abnormal hemoglobin known as hemoglobin S. This causes red blood cells to become rigid and sickle shaped under certain conditions. This condition affects the oxygen carrying capacity of red blood cells leading to various health complications. For example, these cells can block blood flow in small blood vessels leading to pain episodes, then anemia, organ damage and increased sustainability to infections. But how these genetic disorders actually happen across generations? See, SCA is caused by a mutation in the hemoglobin gene inherited from both parents. Individuals who inherit one normal hemoglobin gene and one muted gene have sickle cell trait. Okay? This sickle cell trait is actually asymptomatic, however, inheriting two muted genes result in SEA or the sickle cell anemia. Know that SEA follows an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. So for a child to inherit SEA, both parents must carry the sickle cell trait or have SEA themselves. Okay. So with each pregnancy, there is a 25% chance that the child will have SEA, a 50% chance that the child will be a carrier of SCT and a 25% that the child will neither have SEA nor be a carrier. Know that in India, tribal populations like Adivasis and certain communities in Central and Western India have a higher prevalence of the sickle cell gene due to historical geographic isolation and endemic malaria. Until now, there is no cure for sickle cell anemia except for blood transfusion or bone marrow transplantation but currently they are testing with gene editing to find a solution for the sickle cell anemia. So these are all very relevant facts that you have to remember about sickle cell anemia. Make a note of it. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this question corner page. This corner tries to answer one of the crucial question. Why do clouds usually appear white but look grey when they are going to rain? See, UPSC tend to ask questions from very basics. So this article is very important. So let us find the solution in this discussion. See, whenever sunlight hits clouds, the water droplets acts like prism, meaning they split the light into different colors. These colors scattered in various directions, but often recombine due to multiple droplets, making the clouds appear white. So this is the normal phenomena. But just before clouds are going to rain, the water droplets are swollen. They come together to form larger droplets. These droplets absorb more light and transmit less to the base of the clouds. As a result, these clouds have a grayish appearance. And this is the reason why the cloud base looks gray to people on the ground, while the top remains white when viewed from above. Similar scattering happens with dust particles known as my scattering, which occurs when particle sizes are comparable to the wavelength of light. 
so i hope now you know why the clouds appear gray when they are about to rain also know that the sky appears blue due to rayleigh scattering it is a process where shorter wavelength of light that is blue and violet are scattered more efficiently by the molecules in the earth's atmosphere at sunrise and sunset the sun's light has to pass through a greater thickness of the earth's atmosphere most of the shorter wavelengths are scattered out of the direct path to the observer leaving the longer wavelength that is the red and orange to dominate this will make the sun appear red and the sky around it appear orange or red hope now you can get an idea about how different natural features get their own color so with these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion now look at this first question about elephants three statements are given and you have to find how many statements given here is or are correct first statement says both male and female elephants have tusks but they are larger in female this statement is incorrect male elephants have larger tusks second statement says indian elephant predominantly found in india is smaller than the african elephant and has smaller ears this statement is correct and the third statement says karnataka has the largest population of elephant in india this statement is also correct so the correct answer for this question is option b 2 and 3 only moving on look at this question about sickle cell anemia two statements are given and you have to find which of the statements given here is or are correct first statement says it is a form of genetic disease that affect the red blood cells of the body this statement is correct the second statement says there is no cure for most people with sickle cell anemia this statement is also correct however stem cell or bone marrow transplant can cure the disease but these come with several risks displayed here is the mains practice question for you today just go through the question try to answer it in the comment section we'll try to evaluate your answer in the comment section itself so if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel now thank you so much for listening